So um, this was supposed to be a dry run for a talk that I'm giving in a meetup next week or the week after, but I ended up already giving this talk at another meetup on Tuesday. So I'm now a pro at this talk, and it's going to be so smooth. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so this is about a technique that's becoming reasonably popular amongst functional Scala libraries recently called Bring Your Own Effect. Um, FS2 is doing it, HTTP 4S is doing it, um, and I recently did it for uh, for a library called Scala Cache that I maintain. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means and how I did it in Scala Cache and why you might want to use it in your own code. Uh, so I'd like to start by reminiscing about the good old days. Back before I was writing Scala, um, a few years ago, I was writing Java for a long time. Back then, life was so simple. So Java had features, but they were a bit rubbish. No one really used them, because all you could do on them was call get, and that just blocks until the, the future completed. So they weren't proper features anyway. Uh, so in general, if you were going to expose an API that did some kind of I.O. like this, um, it would just return the, the value as is. And if something goes wrong, you know, just throw an exception. Why not? Uh, and it might take a millisecond to return. It might take seconds. It might never return. It just blocks the thread until it returns. Um, so, yeah, not ideal, but at least it was simple. Uh, then I started writing Scala, and then suddenly everybody had to be reactive. Does anyone remember the reactive manifesto? Hands up if you signed the manifesto. I did. Because <laughs> there was a button you could click. It was exciting, so I signed it. Um, so if you were going to write an equivalent uh, API in Scala, it would probably look more like this. So here everything is now wrapped in a future. So instead of blocking the, the thread that you're on, on the current thread, it now occurs on a different thread. So the thread that you're on can actually carry on and do what you need to do. You can be responsive to user requests. Um, but Sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes it's just a lot simpler to do something on the same thread, just keep it synchronous like we did in Java. So you kind of want to support both of these techniques. So if you're offering this as an API like I do in Scala Cache, you might want to have like two versions of it. You have an async version where everything's wrapped in a future and a sync version where it just operates on the existing thread and throws exceptions. Um, and maybe, depending on what the actual implementation of that trait is, you might choose the appropriate one. Like Redis, that will be happening across the network, so it will be doing proper I.O. It, it should be done asynchronously. Whereas something like Caffeine, that's an in-memory cache. It takes a nanoseconds. It's not going to fail. So sync makes more sense there. Or alternatively, you could think about it a slightly different way Think of it in terms of what the user wants to do rather than the way the cache is implemented. So the user probably doesn't care that much about which implementation of the cache they're using. They care more about their own needs. Like in this situation, I want it to be wrapped in the future. In this situation, I don't. I just want to get the thing, make it as simple as possible. So you might have just one, in, one API, the, the trait called cache where everything's wrapped in the future. And then you might have kind of wrapper methods that sit on top of that and turn the future into just a plain old value. Um, but then this is also kind of rubbish. It's not very elegant. And you've got these two versions of your API that you need to maintain. And I don't know. I just don't like it very much. Although this is actually what I did in Scala Cache originally. For many years, Scala Cache looked like this. And I implemented it, and at the time I thought, this isn't very nice, but I can't really think of a better way of doing it, so this will do. Um, but I suppose the one good thing about this is that there's only two versions of the API. There's the future one and the non-future one. 
You don't have to worry about any other versions. But wait, here's a Scala Z user. He doesn't like either of these alternatives. He wants to use uh, Scala Z task, um, which is a different kind of monad. monad. It's similar to future, but it allows you to defer your IO until you want to actually explicitly run it. So if you wrap something in future, a uh, normal Scala feature, then it will immediately start executing that code. And it might go and uh, do some IO, launch some missiles or whatever. And you might not want to do it at, at that point because it's impure. It's, it's causing a side effect. So what you might want to do if you're more of a pure functional programmer, like many Scala Z users, is build up a kind of description of the computation, IO that you want to do. And then at the very end, you call unsafe run sync or whatever and it will actually run the, the IO. Yeah. So separating the description from the execution. So Scala Z guy, he wants support for task. And then here is a cats user. He wants support for the shiny new cats effect IO monad. Uh, or maybe he's a Monix user, because that's got its own monad. So there's lots of different, uh, different effect monads coming up every day. Scala Z just released it, or is working on a new IO monad as well for Scala Z 8. So there's more and more versions of these things, and we can't just keep making more copies of our API to support all of them. So obviously, instead of just copy pasting, we want some kind of abstraction here. We want to abstract over this F, where F is the, the kind of effect container in which we wrap our computations. So instead of returning the future of option of D, we return an F of option of D, and we let the user of our library decide what F should be. Uh, so there's just a couple of examples down at the bottom. If you wanted to use features, you would choose future and call cache.get and this type of future. If you're using Scala Z tasks, you call cache.get with task. So let's look at how we might implement a cache in order to, to do this. Oh, sorry, before that, um, there's one question, which is what do you put as your type parameter if you just want a plain old value, like the good old synchronous version of the API that we saw before? Um, it's not a feature, it's not a task, it's a something. You have to put something there. And the answer is, uh, it's called id, or identity. Um, you can do this nice little trick where you just say, you add a type alias saying, id of a is a. It's exactly the same thing. It's kind of a nice stroke of luck that the Scala compiler actually lets you do this. Um, and it works <coughs> most of the time, but occasionally the type checker just doesn't understand that id a is the same thing as a. And it, it can be quite frustrating. You know that they're the same thing, but you can't convince the compiler that they are. OK, so let's uh, try to implement, say, a memcached uh, based cache implementation uh, with this abstract f. So we've got some kind of memcached client that we're wrapping. Uh, let's say we want to implement get. So we need to uh, go and use our memcached client to get a thing, look up a thing with a key in memcached. And then we need to return it as an F of option of V. But how on earth do we do that? Because we don't even know what F is. It's completely abstract. We don't know anything about F by design. So we can't really proceed from there. We need a bit more information about F. So what we need is some kind of type class, uh, which gives us some functions that we can call in order to work with an F. So we don't know exactly what an F is, but we know a few things that we can do with it. So for example, here we assume our type class has a function called pure, where you can pass in a plain value and it will wrap it up in an F for you. So it creates an instance of an F. <coughs> so that's the basic idea. Uh, we have this f, which is abstract, we don't know what it is, but we do have a type class which gives us some uh, methods for working with an f. So what should our type class actually be? Which one do we need? Uh, there's a whole plethora of type classes out there. 
Uh, it kind of depends on what your code needs to do, but in general, the rule of thumb is choose the, the least powerful one that can do what you need. So, for example, if you don't need monadic uh, sequential composition, but you do need applicatives, don't ask for a monad, because you don't need one. Uh, so these are just a few of the most popular type classes. They are in order of increasing power, so each one builds on the one above it. So functor at the top just has a math method, so given an f of a, you can apply a function to it and it will change the insides and turn it into an f of p. Uh, applicative extends functor and it has this pure method that we saw just on the previous slide. That means you can lift a plain value a into an f of a. And in general, you will need to do at least that. So you probably need applicative or better um, in, your, in order to actually create some instances of f of a in the first place. Uh, then monad is the one that we all know and love. Um, that adds a flat map, which means that you can do sequential composition. You can say, do this thing, and then based on the result of that, do the next thing. Then we've got monad error, which is a monad, but it also uh, encodes this idea of error handling. So you can raise errors and you can handle errors. So things like future, that's a monad error because you've got that future failed version of future. Uh, also try, that has success and failure. Uh, they're both examples of monad error. Uh, and then the bottom one, sync and async, this is where we get into actual effects territory. Uh, so sync has this function which I've called delay, uh, which takes in a thunk, which is, you see that little arrow there, the little rocket arrow, that means that it's lazily evaluated. So it takes in a block of code that returns an A, and at some point in time it will evaluate it. So this is a way of deferring your effect, like I was saying people want to do with their Scala Z tasks. So you Instead of evaluating the thing as soon as you call the delay method, it will get evaluated at some point later. Um, so it's got this delay method, and then async has this quite confusing looking signature. Um, it's got a, it takes in a function which, given a callback, returns unit. So the either throwable or a to unit, that is a callback, and you pass in a function which takes that callback and calls it. Um, so I'll give a bit more explanation of that in the next slide. So a quick aside um, about what we mean when we talk about non-blocking or asynchronous I.O. <coughs> so there's a few different ways of doing I.O. The simplest one, as we saw, is just do it on the current thread. And just make your API call and wait until it comes back. Um, then the next one down is to wrap it in a future, which means that it's still blocking a thread somewhere, but it's not this thread. It's on some other thread and maybe another thread. So your current thread can still continue to do work. Then the most powerful version of I.O., I guess, is this kind of callback-based, properly asynchronous one, where you pass in a callback, and at some point in the future, when the I.O. completes, that callback will be called. So there's no thread being blocked here. It's completely event-based. And this is how things work if you're using libraries like Netty, which do uh, kind of event-driven I.O. Obviously, it's uh, more scalable because you don't, you don't block any threads. You can have a lot more of these things in flight at a time. Um, and you can think of these things as having a kind of total order in terms of how powerful they are. If we start at the bottom, we've got the callback-based I.O. that doesn't use any threads, just doing events. <coughs> and then by running, by wrapping it up in that little block of code in the middle, we can turn that into a future. But the important thing is that you can't go back the other way. You can't start with something that's blocking a thread somewhere in the future, and magically turn it into event-based I.O. that doesn't block a thread. That just doesn't work. 
So the one at the bottom is more powerful than, than a future. And similarly, if you have a future, then you can turn that into code that blocks the current thread by just wrapping it in, in a weight, but you can't go the other way. So, um, so the point of this is that we kind of we want our async type class to provide us the most powerful tool that we can, which is the callback based version. So if we have an underlying library like Netty or whatever that can actually support that, then we can make use of it. So after all that, uh, this is the type class that I came up with for Scala Cache. Um, it's basically the same as what I showed on a couple of slides ago. Got all of these methods that we need. Um, here's an example of an, in, an instance of this type class, one for Scala Future. I won't go into detail on all of these, but you can see that mostly it's just delegating to a method that's already on the future anyway, like flat map, for example, just calls flat map on the future itself. So it's mostly just boilerplate. Uh, and then we can see an example of this in action. So this is um, real code from Scala Cache. This is the caffeine implementation of the Cache uh, API. Uh, so this is the get method. It takes in a key, which is a string. It takes a mode, which just wraps uh, this async. <coughs> I didn't want to pass in an async directly because just for kind of user friendliness reasons, it makes a bit more sense in the documentation if you can say, like, choose a mode depending on what you want to work with. So you just import, like, scala cache dot mode dot scala features or something like that. But basically, that just wraps an async. So that mode dot m at the top, that is our instance of the async type class. Um, so caffeine is an in-memory cache, so we're not actually doing any I.O. We don't need to do any fancy async stuff. So all we do is we call delay, um, which is the, the function on the sync type class, which uh, takes in a block of code and delays its evaluation. So that's a pretty simple one. But uh, the memcached implementation is a bit more interesting. Because memcache, uh, I'm using spy memcached under the hood, which is properly asynchronous. It's all events driven. So we get to use the async version. So we call mode.m.async, and we are passed in the callback. That's what CB is. Um, then we do the async call to, to memcache, and when it's completed, for example, down here, we call the callback with the result. Or if we have some kind of error, then we, we pass that error to the callback. And again, this is all deferred until you actually want to run the thing. So, um, this code, this block of code, will only run when you actually pass it a callback. So it won't run until you're ready. Okay, so that's how it all works in Scala Cache. But you might be wondering why should I actually do this in my own code? <coughs> um, so if you're a library author, I think the idea is just that you can give more flexibility. Um, if you think of <coughs> this F that you're returning in your API, which might be future or task or whatever, that's, that's an implementation detail. So you shouldn't really be leaking that in your API. You should be abstracting over it. So if you can abstract over it and let your users choose the F that they want that's most appropriate to their application, then your library will be more useful to more people. Um, and then even if you're not writing a library that's going to be used by thousands of clients all over the world. If you're just writing your own application where you are your own client, I think it's still useful to use these kind of techniques um, because they give you an, an extra level of abstraction that you didn't have before, um, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second. 
uh, and they can help you to simplify testing as well. So what do I mean by extra dimension of abstraction? I mean that you can, um, if you think of the business logic of your code, quite a lot of it is to do with composition of operations. I want to do this thing, and then this thing, and then this thing. That's the logic that you go through, with maybe some branching and so on in there. So you want to focus on that composition and kind of tidy away all the clutter details about what monad you might be using or other implementation details. So this kind of this decoupling can help to tidy up your code and help you focus. So an example, this is based on the identity admin service, which Steve over there and I have been working on in the identity team. So this is a service that's all to do with um, creating users, updating users, updating permissions, that kind of stuff. So we've got a couple of algebras here. Uh, one to do with persistence, like saving the users to the data store, and one to do with events, sending Kafka events when we've done things. And you can see both of them are abstract in this F. We don't want to worry about what that is. So we've got functions for saving users, finding users, sending a created user event. And then we've got this trait user ops, which extends both of them. Um, and it specifies that F must be a monad of some kind, but we don't care what that monad is. All we care about is it's a monad so we can do sequential composition. So we can write them in a full comp comprehension like this. Um, and this is the, the business logic that I was talking about. So creating a user should involve saving the user to the database, looking them up from the database, and then sending a, a Kafka event saying that you've done so. Um, and because we don't know what F is, we, we don't have to worry about the details. We can just see the composition. <coughs> uh, so the next step would be to actually choose the monad that you want to use. Um, in our case, we have, an, we return an either uh, of user service failure or A, whatever A is, uh, because we need to handle errors. Uh, and we also need to pass in some context involving including things like trace token for the request. So we have an either wrapped up in a uh, client. So it's quite a complex monad, but just to sound like a broken record, we don't care about that over here when we're just composing things together. Um, and then finally, you actually do your, your concrete implementation details. So actually talking to the data store and talking to Kafka and so on. Uh, and at this point, the monad has become concrete so that you can return the correct errors and so on and get hold of the context. Um, this mix-in style where you've got code for stated things to database and code for sending Kafka events all mixed up in the same class might make people a bit uneasy. You don't have to write it like this. It's kind of a personal style thing, I suppose, but you can structure it in a more compositional way. So you could have a uh, my lovely user service that takes in what they called uh, a persistence and an events as parameters, okay. constructor injection, and then delegates to those. It's kind of doesn't really matter. Um, so, in conclusion, abstract early and commit late, by which I mean. Abstract as many things as you can, as quick, as early as you can. Like, for example, this F. We don't want it to be hard coded to a feature or a task. We want to abstract it, and then commit to a concrete implementation as late as you can. So at the point where you're kind of wiring your application together, that's where you commit to concreteness. Um, so the other, the only thing I didn't talk about was testing. I mentioned briefly that this can simplify your testing. It does that in a couple of ways. Um, first is that you can test this user ops trait 
test this uh, composition is being done correctly. But when you write your test for that, you can choose whatever f you'd like. So you can choose a very simple monad like the identity monad, which makes it simpler to write your tests. You don't have to worry about constructing one of these prize these of either thingies. And then the other way that it can help simplify your testing is if you've got these uh, algebras at the top, this persistence and events, they kind of represent your primitive operations that your application can do. And then anything else down at the bottom, that's just kind of combining them in different orders. So to some extent, if you test, unit test the things at the top, the primitive operations, then there's, you can have a reasonable confidence without testing that create user will, will do what it's supposed to do. So there's kind of two elements to the, the way it can simplify the tests. Okay, that's all I've got. Any questions? Okay. Uh, so next, Ferdy and I are going to talk about Code Mesh, which we went to recently. Uh, so Code Mesh was a uh... It was a bit of an art conference. Uh, they profile themselves as the disruptive conference for uh, topics that might not have gotten, uh, gotten too much attention in uh, other conferences. Um, so let's go through the speakers, since the schedule is not there anymore. Yeah, I'm just getting the schedule on my <laughs> phone. They had a really good app. It's called Hoover. And the schedule is on there. So, <coughs> start with the opening keynote. Yeah. Automatically scalable computation by Margot Seltzer. Um, so, the, you want to talk about the idea behind the kind of was uh, how can we automatically make programs more scalable by uh, throwing more CPUs against it? Um, the idea she had was that you can see a program as uh, one path through the Memory space. Since you map your, um, you model your memory as a as a big space, then your program takes a takes a path through that space. Um, but obviously, you can't just arbitrarily put CPUs in different parts of the, the path. But you can put predictions on where the program might go. And if one of the um, you can have the CPUs calculate from there, and if the Program actually gets there. Sort of fast forward. She yeah. started some quite impossible, but mm. so yeah, that's, that's what results. I liked about it is that it sounds completely crazy. <laughs> like it would never work, but then she showed some actual results from it. it. Seems like, depending on the the program that you run it against, she got like twenty times speed up, I think, just by kind of guessing what the program is going to do a bit later. Kind of like CPU path prediction, but sort of, uh, yeah, but like a hundred thousand instructions level instead of twenty instructions. Apparently, they were doing it on the binary level, maybe with the some help of the compiler, we could get even better results. Yeah. Um, next, which one did you go to? Uh, I went to the flying spaghetti monster. Okay, we talked about that. Uh, the idea was that uh, in microservices you have a lot of protocols uh, to communicate between the different microservices and you can um, encode those as state machines. Um, he, had, he did this using uh, dependent types to get rid of a couple more uh, runtime errors. Um, it's best to combine it with the, the next talk because there was also about um, state machines and dependent types. He showed a couple of different levels of how to do it. For example, you could write in in, uh, in S core and encode every edge of your state machine as a type class, and the implementation of your program would be the instances of those type classes. Um, take it even further. Didn't really understand how he did them. <laughs> <laughs> Wait to read them. This was Oscar 
with Strom, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, he's yeah. now doing, he's writing a series of blog posts based on that talk. Ah. So, pretty interesting. Uh, I went to developing the sound diffusive acoustic panels of the Elbe Philharmonie, There's this concert hall in Hamburg, um, which just took about 10 years to build and it's opened recently and it's got this amazing fancy architecture to it. So it's all very weirdly shaped. There's no straight edges, everything's curved. And then they, they employed this guy's company to come up with like the ideal acoustic design for acoustic panels for this place. So he used lots of clever algorithms and uh, worked out the exact shape and size of the little kind of cells that you need to have on the acoustic panels and where they should go in the hall. Worked with an acoustician it was all very interesting. So they made a one of the ten scale models as well? What yeah. They use it for? Yeah, they made a scale model out of wood and cardboard and things, one tenth size of the entire hall, like in amazing detail. And they put little people in all of the seats. Uh, and then they put the sound source on the stage. Uh, they had to scale up the sound by ten times because the place was ten times smaller. So you couldn't actually hear it. But um, and then they just had microphones all over this, including like in the little people's ears, the little tiny people <laughs> had microphones in their ears so they could tweak the acoustics. It was really cool. Uh, then I went to Beyond Eventual Consistency. That was Jamie Allen, who used to work at Life End and is at Starbucks these days. Uh, he was saying he's tired of eventual consistency databases. They, they aren't really that useful for a lot of his business cases you end up having to kind of hack around eventual consistency when you want to do very simple things, like just kind of make sure a payment has happened or whatever. So he's been looking at uh, things like Google Spanner and a few different databases. He was kind of doing a survey of modern consistent databases. <coughs> he talked about one called FaunaDB, which they're testing at the moment. Um, it seemed quite positive so far, but they haven't actually run it in production. Death of logging to have like massive transactions on a global scale. Aren't yeah, sounds suspicious to me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that also one that you could query in different points of time? Yes. Yeah, that's quite cool. So you can say what run this query, but show me what the results would have been at this time yesterday, three p.m. What was his view of Spanner? Um, I don't think he'd actually tried it. I can't remember why. Uh, he tried CockroachDB, which is like an open source version of Spanner. But because they don't have the true time thing, the atomic clocks that Google have, I think there's a minimum bound on the query, the latency of the queries. It's like 200 milliseconds, something like that. So not really that useful for a lot of cases. We both went to infinite lambda calculus. That was weird. Yeah. Was a uh, talk about lambda calculus, but it was. Um, I think they said it was a follow up to a talk they did before. And they were trying to do recursion in lambda calculus, which is not naturally there. And they were using a fixed point or a white point. I don't think there's too much else to say about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Then I went to Daniel Spiewak's talk about Cat's effect which is kind of relevant to the talk I just gave. It's talking about the design de, kind of design strategy but behind that library, and just generally dissing Scala Z. <laughs> <laughs> which one did you go? I went to influence of type setting in programming with a setting in um, parentheses. It was taught by a self proclaimed weirdo that was really into knitting. She made a, a tool to Make knitting patterns that you could use on a, a hacked knitting machine from the 70s, I think. Um, and because of that, she got really into typesetting and she gave a sort of a historical view of throughout the um, typesetting from physical machines to um, PostScript and PDF. She also mentioned a movie, Line and Type, the film, that um, 
is about one of the, those machines. It sounds like a good watch. Uh, I went to distributed systems, what can go wrong will go wrong, which sounds quite interesting, but wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. And then I went to a little taste of types. Uh, was it by David Christensen? Um, together with Dan Friedman, who also worked on the little schema, writing an introductory book about type type dependent programming. And it's the they gave, a, uh, they gave a little demo about five, which is the language that uh, accompanies the group. What's it called? Five. Five. Like, uh, uh, I went to blockchains, block weaves, and the decentralized revolution, um, which was quite ambitious. They're trying to build an okay, internet archive but decentralized based on this thing called a block weave, which is like a blockchain, but better, apparently. <laughs> I don't know, it was, all, it was all very blockchain. <laughs> and then we had a <coughs> keynote by Guy Steele, which was pretty intense. It went on for like 90 minutes, and it was very, very thorough. So basically, in computer science papers, especially like type theory papers, you have this notation that people use to kind of talk about their programs. It's kind of like pseudocode or like type, inf type rules notation, I suppose. Uh, it doesn't really have a name, but he calls it computer science meta notation. And it doesn't have a spec, and it's just kind of grown organically. And He's become really, really interested in this thing. <laughs> Enough so that he looked through by hand 17,000 pages of conference papers from the last 50 years and compiled this survey of like all the different little dialects of this notation and inconsistencies between them. And then he told us all about it in massive detail <laughs> while we waited for the party and the beer. Which is kind of a shame because he worked on so many interesting projects like. Yeah, uh, he's a hero. Yeah, so many languages. Uh, so we're on to day two. Uh, the opening keynote was a history of some functional programming languages by David Turner. Um, it was really interesting as well. It was like hearing a sommelier talking about different programming languages. Um, he went from the Lambda calculus to all the lisps. <laughs> all the lisps and then uh, one interesting thing that I took away from it was that uh, most of the old functional programming languages were untyped, and the types were more widely used in the imperative languages. Uh, came a lot later in the functional languages. Um, <coughs> then I went to Would Aliens Understand Lambda Calculus? Uh, I can't really remember this one because I was hacking on Scala <laughs> Cache at the time. <laughs> but I'm sure it was interesting. Um, it went from the idea that uh, math is something that exists intrinsically outside of uh, human beings. Uh, showed an experiment that babies can even uh, count to two. Um, but it was also the notion of math being, or at least our understanding of math being somewhat cultural. Um, an example he gave that reduction is. Uh, Lies a notion of direction from a higher order to a lower order. Uh, from that, he gave an analysis from three types of aliens, of which some of them probably understand lambda calculus and some not. Um, next, I went to persisting object oriented state in a functional language, Erlang, of course. I um, wasn't really sure what this guy's point was. But it's kind of um, we had this idea that maybe we could give every user their own database and run to keep their state on their device and not have a central database. But obviously, that doesn't really work. So. 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to see Hexel up a panel for concurrency. Uh, they described <laughs> the path they were taking for this tool, this extension for Haskell. Um, best explain. Um, they wanted to easily make it possible to run multiple small tasks concurrently, concurrently without texting the programmer too much about thinking the dependencies. Uh, what they ended up with was an extension to the JITS C compiler that would um, analyze your do notations to, if possible, run them as applicatives so that it could be run parallel instead of sequential on the VPS moment. They were working on version two where they don't where the phases don't have to wait on each other. Uh, next was peeling the banana, recursion schemes from first principle by Zainab Ali. Um, yeah, she's been talking quite a lot about recursion schemes recently. She gave a really good talk about it at Scala World as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to know anything about recursion schemes, just look for her. Well, it was interesting that she also mentioned uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a shame that during the design of Haskell, we didn't really take into account all these theoretical things. Hmm. And during the answering of the questions, somebody said, well, actually, we thought uh, it was a bit too early to introduce these kind of concepts. Brenda was part of the design committee. At least I assume. Yeah, that was a cool thing about this conference. It was full of these computer science heroes just wandering around like, the guy who made Haskell. Uh, then the next one was from code to construction, how to utilize scripting to design optimized architectural designs, which I thought was to do with software architecture, but she was actually an architect. Uh, yeah. So she was talking about how she writes scripts in her software called Rhino. Yeah, Rhino. Um, in order to design cool things. That was pretty interesting. And then we, had, we both went to revisiting concatenative languages with creative programming. Um, it's a type of programming that I'd, I'd never heard before, but um, after thinking about it, I've encountered it a lot. Um, it's a type of programming where everything is from a function from state to state. Uh, for example, uh, two is a function that puts two on the stack. And for example, print is a function which takes the last thing on the stack, pops it and prints it. Um, he did a, a bunch of drawing things with it. Um, he also went into the culture of some of those programming languages. Um, and then into a thing that he calls factoring, which is uh, practically what we call refactoring. I think fourth is probably the most famous of these languages. Um, there's also one called Joy, which I've never heard of, but comes at it from a more academic angle, apparently. And then Factor was made in the 2000s and is probably the most production ready. And then finally, the closing keynote, winning the war on error, solving the halting problem and curing cancer. Uh, this was Matt Might, who is just a bit of a legend. He was a computer science professor for about 10 years, doing quite theoretical programming language theory stuff. Um, but then his son was born with this rare genetic disease, so he decided, oh, I need to become a biologist in order to find the cure for my son's disease. And now he's like completely crossed over from computer science to biology, and he's leading this Precision Medicine Institute, all about like using people's data, like their genome, for example, to find pinpoint the exact drug that they need for their rare disease, and hopefully cure cancer. So that was pretty cool. Made me feel a bit depressed about my own job. <laughs> I'm not curing cancer. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs>